My name is George Kurtz. I'm the CEO of a company called CrowdStrike. I'm actually uh, one of the authors of that book, Hacking Exposed, which I wanted to give out to the, uh, to the folks that came today. And I really wanted to spend a little time talking about white hat versus black hat and some of the things that I've done um, and some of the things that hopefully you guys will be exposed to that might be a good opportunity from a career perspective. So let me, uh, let me jump into this, talk a little bit about myself. My first computer was a TI-994A. Now for the parents, I don't want to see any hands, but for the kids, how many, people, how, many, how many kids have ever heard of that computer? Not many, right? How many parents have heard of that thing? Had a few, right? Remember those days. Uh, that actually was my first computer. It was 16K memory, um, super slow, cassette drive. Took a while to load games and um, started lear learning to program in BASIC uh, way back when. I graduated to running a bulletin board when I was in uh, high school, which was a, we didn't really have the internet at the time, so it was a 300 baud modem. Uh, the first modem I had, had basically was an acoustic coupler that you would put the phone on, and uh, you're lucky, you know, you would pray that you would actually get a 300 baud connection. Um, and if you're not familiar with modem, you should look that up. There's a lot of good hacking that took place uh, in the modem world. Uh, I started to break into computers in 1993 and uh, get paid for it. And I was a security consultant, um, a lot you know, similar to some of the folks that you probably already heard talk. Uh, but that really got me started in, in security. And um, that's really what I want to talk about today is, is uh, making a career in security. So the book that I gave you, uh, I was one of the authors that wrote that in uh, 1999. Um, 600,000 copies sold, 30 different languages. Um, it's been around the world. so. It's a, uh, it's a really good starter book if you wanted to get into security. That's why I wanted to, to give it to you guys today. I started my first company when I, went, when I was 29. Sold that when I was 33. I spent uh, seven years with a company called McAfee. Any, anybody use McAfee at home? Okay. Uh, don't flog me if it's slow. So I spent a number of years there. I, I finished up as a worldwide CTO, and then I started another company called CrowdStrike uh, in 2011. Uh, Love all things technology related, and my first DEF CON, what, it's DEF CON what, 21 now? Yeah, my first DEF CON was DEF CON 2. So it's been, uh, it's been uh, a while. So my son couldn't be here today. I was actually trying to get him here, and uh, he plays Park Warner football, and the first day of practice was yesterday, so he needed to be here for that. But uh, he's, a, uh, he's an interesting character. One of the reasons that I wanted to do this talk is because I think it's really important for kids to realize what's, what you can and can't do, what, what's good. So I travel a lot for my job, and I, I was actually happened to be home one day, and I got a phone call from the principal of my son's school. And uh, she says, uh, Mr. Kurtz? I said, yes. She says, uh, you need to come into the office. And I said, okay, well, you know, what's going on? You know, luckily, I was home. She says, uh, we have a problem with Alexander. I said, okay, well, what, what, what's the story? Well, Alexander has been hacking into our computers. And I said, okay, well, what was going on? Can you give me the details? No, no, sir, you have to come down. This is a problem. It's a big deal. We take this very seriously. He was hacking into the computers. I go, well, I, I just don't understand. She said, sir, I don't understand where he learned these skills, but he was hacking into the computers. Do you know where he learned these skills? And I said, uh, like any good dad, I said, yeah, his mom. So anyway, he's... Uh, He's a funny kid, and uh, my daughter Allegra, she also loves uh, Minecraft and, and fun games like that. I guess all you guys, I can't keep track of these 8-bit graphic games. We all wanted to graduate to real graphics, and you guys go back to 8-bit, but anyway. So definition of a hacker, um, you know, I always like to, to talk about hackers because they, you know, they're, they're used in, the definition I should say is used in multiple ways. And, a lot of times the media will portray a hacker as a bad guy or a bad girl or a bad woman breaking into different systems. And while that definition is somewhat true today, the original definition was much different. It was really folks who were curious, people that wanted to explore computers and really understand how they work. Uh, and there's a few notable folks that I'm going to go through in a little bit. But So now we've got a situation where hacker was originally good as, as a term. And then we have this concept now of white hat and black hat hackers. And that's really what I wanted to dive into because there's <coughs> multiple paths that you can go down. And uh, I just wanted to go through some of the options and what happens in, in either path. 
So some of the good hackers, Steve Wozniak, how many, how many use Apple here, right? Probably all the kids. It's not a good sign for Microsoft. Uh, Steve Wozniak was one of the founders of Apple, and uh, him and Steve Jobs used to build blue boxes. And when I was a kid, I used to build blue boxes. And blue boxes used to basically allow you to put up a little box onto the payphone, and you would hit a button, and it would actually make the sound of a quarter going into the phone. And you'd be able to make a free phone call. Uh, well, they used to build them, and then they used to sell them. So uh, ultimately, you know, these are really good guys, but they start off being super curious and, and building these sort of things. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor of the World Wide Web. Let me get out of the way so you can see this. Um, so he's what I would consider, you know, great hacker. He decided that the way things were working and text just wasn't suitable, so he created the World Wide Web. So these are folks that I would say are, are classic hackers in the good sense, where they were curious, there was a problem, and they decided to solve it. There's some other folks, it's hard to read all the names up there, that this is sort of the, the hit list of mugshots of people who did bad things. Now there's some notables in there. Uh, the first one, Robert Morris, uh, that was really the first internet worm. And uh, that was a bit of a project in, in school that got away from him and, and ultimately shut down a whole big part of the internet. Um, there's some other folks, uh, Kevin Mitnick, who's a very famous guy. You might see him running around this conference this weekend. I'll get back to him. He got chased around all over the country by the FBI for breaking into lots of stuff. Uh, and the list goes on and on. I won't go through all of them, but uh, there's some notable guys. One of these guys uh, at the end, Albert Gonzalez, I'm going to tell a story about him in just a moment. But Kevin Mitnick and uh, actually Kevin Polson actually turned out to be good guys now. So Kevin Mitnick, uh, very notable hacker, uh, guy I know. He's now a security consultant, turned his life around. Uh, I know him because I sent him a book when he was in jail, and he's, he's never forgotten it. He was uh, pretty grateful. But he turned out to be a good guy, turned his life around. So what I'm saying here is you don't want to go down the path of some of these folks because it's easy to get sucked into breaking into computers and, and not necessarily doing the right thing. So Albert Gonzalez started writing viruses at the age of nine. Okay? That's pretty impressive, um, writing at the age of nine. Now, what did he do with this? Smart guy. He got caught hacking into the Indian government systems, uh, arrested for ATM fraud. Uh, TJX Network and, and many others, uh, a laundry list of big attacks that he was associated with. And ultimately what happened was the government caught him and said, you're going to go to jail unless you work for us. And they sent him back into the field to go try to recruit other hackers and, and get more information on them. And ultimately he became a bad hacker again, so he flipped and then they had to rearrest him. So he's a guy that's gotten himself in a lot of trouble. Uh, and unfortunately ended up in the wrong path. Um, that was a pretty obvious case. This is a, a little bit of a different case. And this is one that I really want to drive home with you guys. Uh, if you have friends, uh, relatives, mom, dad, sisters, brothers, this is a guy who got five years in jail after hacking his wife's email. Now you would think it's his wife's email, why should he go to jail? Well, he actually went to jail for hacking his wife's email. So it seems like a simple thing, you know, it might be fun, it might be cute, but there are ramifications for these activities. And, you know, again, you just need to understand what's in bounds and, and what isn't uh, in bounds. So let me talk a little bit about the cool stuff, white hat and black hat hacking. Um, I got first into uh, penetration testing before it was, you know, really even called that. That's why I wrote the book. There were no books out to, to help people. Um, now it's a big industry. But you have software engineers, you have Malware researchers at our company, we have a lot of folks that actually look at the malware, the viruses that, that are out there, and they research them, they understand how they work, and they break them down. So there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity within the security space if you focus your efforts. So the white hat guys get to, go, get to do cool things without going to jail. That's the fun part. What I want to reinforce here is you actually get to do the same sort of things that the bad guys do. You just don't go to jail for it, which is a really cool thing, right? You get to break into computers, you get to chase the bad guys around, you get to uh, reverse engineer their malware, figure out how it works, and you know cause them some pain in, in what they're doing. So let me give you a, kind of a fun thing that we do, and one of the areas I spend a lot of my time on. Uh, how many folks here have kind of heard about all the hacking in uh, from China, right? You've heard all about that. 
that's not only China, you've got Middle East and, and other places outside the US. So one of the things that I do on a daily basis at my company CrowdStrike is we actually track the bad guys uh, from where they are. So we track a group of about 30 different groups um, in China um, by name, by, by campaign, depends on the particular group they might be hitting, companies like Google and Amazon and Intel, they might be hitting banks and oil companies, but we actually go through the trouble of tracking them down. So we understand who they are, what they're doing, we actually have pictures on them, and we track their behaviors so that we can protect other companies, a lot of the companies in the U.S. and the U.S. government. Yeah, question. That's, that's a great question. Once we find them, what do we do? Um, well, if you reported them to the government of China, the Chinese government wouldn't really do anything about it. So it's a little less important about reporting them. Unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do if they're outside the U.S. But generally what we do is, if you think about a bank robber, a bank robber has a certain way they operate. And we want to understand how, what their mode of operation is so that we can protect other customers from getting broken into. So that's why we track these guys. And um, ultimately, there's not a lot you can do from a legal perspective if they're outside the U.S. in certain, certain countries. But that's a great question. So we track other folks in Iran, India, and other places. And I actually, we've made some shirts up with all of these funny names. Now, it's a little bit hard to read, but we have uh, names like uh, Deep Panda, Karma Panda, Radio Panda. These, these are crypto names for uh, actors out of China. Panda is associated with China. We have Tiger India. Um, we have uh, Kitten out of Iran. I didn't make this up. We have funny researchers that, that make all these names up. But in any case, that's why I'm wearing this shirt, which uh, is one of the actors. And I actually have some shirts that I'll give to you guys at the end. But it's a really cool emerging um, area within security, security intelligence. And if, if you like to track the bad guys down, it's almost like if you ever want to be a cop, you can be the electronic version of that, right? You can track them down, you can understand how they operate. And ultimately, if you can disrupt what they're trying to do, you make it really hard for them, right? If you find where they're working from and you can uh, disrupt that infrastructure, they have to go somewhere else. So that's really a, uh, a neat area, and it's fascinating when you actually find their pictures. I, didn't, I have a whole bunch of pictures of folks. I, I didn't have enough time to put them up. Uh, but one of, the, one of the actors we call Anchor Panda, and we, we like to give you know, cute names and pictures to them. But this is actually the, uh, the PLA Navy. So the People's Liberation Army, uh, the Navy branch of that is what we term Anchor Panda because they're actually focused on oceanic activities. So anything associated with sort of blue-green water activities, um, shipbuilding, uh, U.S. Navy, anything along those lines around the world, that's what they break into. And um, they, they typically like to break in by sending a spearfish. So you know those emails that look legitimate when you click on them, they infect your computer? That's what they send and they get into computers. We were lucky enough, they were trying to break into a bunch of computers and we were lucky enough to see one of their systems on the internet that was basically open. So we began monitoring that system and we began seeing all the, uh, every piece of malware they had, every time they try to create a new campaign and spearfish another company, we would actually see it before, before it would go out, before the companies were broken into, and then we would let those companies know about it. So we were really ahead of the curve. You know, that was our mission to protect those, those customers. A um, couple other fun things that I've been involved in is um, cell phone hacking. Yes. This kid's smart. Who's is this your son? You got your hands full. This is uh he's uh he's on the ball. That's a great question. The question was, did we just tell our customers or did we tell everybody? The answer is we actually told everybody we could. And the, the honest truth was uh, it was Christmas Eve and all of our emails started to light up because we were monitoring this particular adversary. I happened to be with my wife and kids and uh, she was wondering where I was for dinner because um, we were on the East Coast with some relatives and uh, we were actually uh, sending victim notification letters out. So we would tell the victims that they were going to be attacked. We would give them all the information we have. We didn't hold anything back. And we got to as many people, as many big companies that we could in that short period of time. So it was more of a community service, and we tried to help everybody out. So it's a good question. Okay, so let me give you some other cool things that I worked on. Uh, cell phones. How many of you guys have cell phones? 
a pretty good amount. Okay. My, uh, my son, who's 12, keeps hitting me up for one, but I, he still has his, uh, his uh, iPod Touch with Google Voice and all kinds of other things. So it's effectively a phone as long as he's on a Wi-Fi network. But one of the things that, that I did at a prior security conference is um, I decided to figure out how susceptible these phones were to attack. So what we did is we went out to the black market. In the black market, you can actually buy security vulnerabilities. And we went out to sort of this, I say black market, it was maybe like a gray market. Some people that we knew when we said, we need 20 vulnerabilities for a phone, and we want to know how much that is. Take a guess how, many, how much 20 vulnerabilities for a phone is. 10 million, not quite. We were lucky because they were just 10 flaws they weren't weaponized vulnerabilities. So there's a difference between being able to actually break in and actually having a flaw. Uh, we paid $1,500 for 20 vulnerabilities within a phone. Actually, it was within the browser. Uh, so what we decided to do was to go through all 20 of those and find one that was applicable to uh, the browser. And the browser code in Android and Apple, they share the same code, but they're different phones. Uh, we didn't have really enough time to work on the, the Apple stuff, so we went after Android. So we actually weaponized the vulnerability, and I'll show you what it looks like and, and what the attack actually did. So we sent a fake SMS message to your phone that said, hey, your phone's going to stop working unless you click on this carrier update so that we can make sure that your carrier list is always updated. So we did that, and we used a uh, website which allows you to send fake SMS messages. So we sent that out first. So phase one, send a fake SMS message, click on this. Now, most people... You know, they see a message on their phone. It looks like it's from AT&T or Verizon or whoever, and they click on it. Once you click on it, we then exploited the vulnerability that was in the browser. Okay, and, and that was the vulnerability that we bought. But again, that vulnerability didn't do anything until we weaponized it. We actually had to build all of the tools necessary to weaponize and exploit uh, the Android operating system. So once we, once we exploited that, we were running as the... the, the the privilege of the browser, which actually doesn't have a lot of privileges, okay? So the next thing that we did is we escalated our privilege. And this is these are just common techniques that you can actually read about in the book. So we went from a very low-level privilege user, which was nobody, to the most privileged user, which was root, because the Android operating system runs essentially a modified version of Linux. Then from there, we actually took a Chinese remote access tool. We actually found this in one of our investigations and we modified it and we installed it on the phone. Now, once we installed it on the phone, we had no way to control it because we only got the malware itself. We didn't actually have the server part of uh, the, 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 the malware, if you will. So we went out and uh, we actually built our own command and control server for the malware. We integrated it into uh, Google so that we can do some really cool things. And you can see the map up here. You can actually track via GPS, the location of where people are at. So the funny story is one of our researchers w was working on this, and he went out on a Friday night, and when he got back home, uh, it was pretty late. It was about 11 o'clock on the East Coast, and um, you know, it was 8, eight o'clock for me on the um, West Coast. So I knew he was home, so I, I actually chatted with him. He had a, a chat software running, and I said, hey, I'm glad you're home. And his wife, wife freaked out because you know, I was actually tracking their movements of where they were at. But those are the kind of cool things that you can actually do. So let me, let me give you the, the quick rundown on what you can do once you compromise a phone. You can track all of your mov movements via GPS. You can actually hijack the phone calls. So we were actually listening to his phone calls as they were going out, actually slightly after because it would make a recording. Uh, we were able to get all his text messages. We were able to get all his emails. And uh, we were actually able to hot mic the phone. So as the phone was just sitting there, we can actually turn the mic on. Uh, it's the ultimate spy weapon, but those are some of the cool things that we were actually able to do. Question? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a demo, you know, so we weren't all that concerned. We didn't have a lot of sensitive information on it, and uh, it took us about, you know, three weeks' worth of effort with some really smart guys, so we weren't all that concerned that somebody was going to be able to do that uh, on this particular case. But um, uh, I have been involved in uh, penetration tests and uh, incident response engagements where 
some hackers actually hack the other hackers' software to get in. You know, they already had a back door and they hacked the back door so that the, the second group of uh, hackers could get in. So anyway, long story short on this, this was a, a total compromise. So as I always like to say, just to wrap up, you've got, uh, you've got black hats that sort of end up here on the FBI most wanted list. This was actually a Russian crime group. Uh, they got busted in, they're spending a lot of time in jail. Uh, it looks like a, a very smart audience. Um, so you, you don't necessarily want to end up there. So this was me in 1993 when I really got my start in security. Um, those are a little bit older computers. Probably don't remember those, uh, those monitors. Parents do, I know. Uh, this was actually me. I've been lucky enough to travel around the world. This was the, the cast of uh, uh, Super 8, if you remember that movie. Met them on a plane. And um, as I like to say, the, uh, the White Hats end up here, you know, first place on the podium. Um, these are some of the fun things that I get to do in my spare time race cars. So uh, you can really make a great career in security if you put your mind to it. And um, it's easy to get sidetracked and go down the wrong path and you just need to think about what you're trying to do. So with that, uh, I want to wrap up and I'll answer any questions that you might have uh, before we conclude. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question was, has, the, has Android actually fixed it? Uh, they, they continue to fix those updates. They actually did. We worked with Google before we released it which is uh, called Responsible Disclosure. And they were able to come out with a patch and fix it. Um, we subsequently found other vulnerabilities, which we actually talked about at Black Hat. We might be talking, I can't remember, at DEF CON here. Um, but that's part of the research community. If people build software, they're gonna make mistakes. And the bad guys are actively looking to try to break into those systems and exploit those mistakes. So, you know, this is really, you know, the next wave of, of defenders here being able to find um, those sort of flaws and protect uh, customers and, you know, your parents and uh, your friends against what the bad guys are going to try to do. It's only going to get worse. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you can't sleep at night, you have a, a book to, to read. Um, there'll be a test next year. Uh, I, I do recommend taking a look at it if you have uh, VMware or, you know, mom or dad can set up a test system at home. I'm sure there's probably a lot of mom and dads that have their own test system that's set up away from everybody else, and uh, they'll let you bang on that. Um, so with that, I want to wrap up. Thank you for your time, and uh, have a great conference, and hopefully we'll see you guys soon.